Welcome again to Engineering Science 211, Material Safety and Equipment Overview for Nanotechnology. And we're in Unit 2, we're discussing the infrastructure necessary to do nanotechnology research, nanotechnology development work, and nanotechnology production. And the outline we're following for Unit 2 is as follows. We first discussed infrastructure. What is it? Why do we need it? And uh, as you recall, in those lectures, we said, of course, we need infrastructure, we need facilities, uh, we need equipment, we need to have some place to actually do the nanotechnology work, and that's the facilities. And then we need the wherewithal to actually do the, the production of nano uh, structures and the research with nano structures, and of course, that wherewithal that we need is the equipment. And we discussed the fact that there are two types of equipment that uh, th those types of equipment that are vacuum based and equipment that is non vacuum based. And then uh, we discussed in some depth, but as an overview, uh, some examples of vacuum based systems. Now we're, we're in lectures four, five, and six, and um, these focus on vacuum systems themselves because we learned that vacuum is a very, very important in nanotechnology and making devices uh, for reasons that uh, uh, we discussed in depth. The fact that uh, you can safely confine the process, you can very, very carefully control contamination issues and therefore lead to better yield and a better uh, uh, performance. Uh, and uh, then we also discussed the fact that when you have the processing going on, in a vacuum chamber, you can very carefully control the introduction of different kinds of materials and gases. So we uh, looked at that and we saw the importance of vacuum systems. Uh, and in lecture four, we talked about the basics of vacuum, uh, vacuum science and technology. We also talked about mass flow controllers in lecture four. Uh, today, in lecture five, uh, we're going to talk about vacuum gauges and valves. And uh, so we're going to begin Lecture 5, which is Part 2 of this uh, overview of vacuum science and technology. So more on vacuum systems, Part 2, Lecture 5. And the particular topics we're going to cover in the Lecture 5 are here in the outline. We're going to talk about vacuum gauges, residual gas analyzers, and vacuum valves. Well, vacuum gauges. What do we need vacuum gauges for in the first place? Well, we need them to find out where we are in the vacuum regime. We need to know whether we're in our rough vacuum or that is a low vacuum regime, whether we're in a high vacuum regime or, or a regime or an ultra high vacuum regime. We need to know where we are because we need to know if we're at the pressure we want to be at. And of course we know that we're going to be very interested in defining the pressure because when we define the pressure, we define how quickly monolayers form, we define the collision length, we define how many molecules are present, uh, and uh, we de de define the time between collisions. All very, very important uh, attributes of a vacuum. So knowing the pressure is very, very important. In this particular pressure scale, we have the highest pressure atmosphere up here, and then the low pressures are down at this end. So this, the ultra high vacuum, the ultra high vacuum would be down here. The high vacuum is in here, and then the low vacuum or the, or the um, uh, rough vacuum is is in that range. And we have different types of pressure gauges. There's the capacit capacitive manometer, the thermal couple the Barani, the ion, and the residual gas analyzer is on this table, but it's really not a vacuum gauge, it's much more than that. And we'll talk about the residual gas analyzer uh, in some depth in a few moments. But the capacitive manometers obviously are uh, versatile, they cover quite a large pressure range. The thermocouple gauges are not as versatile, and cover only really the roughing vacuum range, as you can see from up here, uh, and, uh, or the low vacuum range. Uh, 
and then the Pirani type gauge gets you down into uh, into the uh, high vacuum range, maybe halfway through, let's say. And then the ion gauges obviously are very good for the uh, high vacuum range, very good for this high vacuum range, and then excellent for the well, covering most of the ultra high vacuum range. Uh, and then the residual gas analyzer, as we said, which it's really not a vacuum gauge, it's much more than that. That uh, is useful uh, as you get into the high vacuum and through the ultra-high vacuum range. So these are different types of gauges that are available and the pressure ranges where they are useful. Let's talk more about these different kinds of pressure gauges. Well, we can, we can classify these pressure gauges that we just talked about in two ways. We can call them direct reading gauges or we can call them indirect reading gauges. And a direct reading gauge actually measures the pressure. And it measures the pressure by calculating the force exerted on some surface by the incident particles. And we know how pressure works. Pressure is gas molecules actually bombarding a surface, exchanging momentum and leaving, thereby creating a force on the surface. So these types of gauges actually measure this force. And of course, force per area is pressure. So let's take a look at one type, a very common type, the one we just mentioned a minute ago, the capacitance manometer. Now this type of gauge uh, is, is in principle very simple. It, it measures pr pressure by measuring the deflection of a diaphragm. And then the diaphragm in deflecting changes the capacitance uh, uh, present and then that's detected electronically. So the, the uh, capacitance manometer consists of two components, a transducer, a flexible, which is a flexible metal diaphragm that converts pressure into an electrical signal, and it does so with the capacitance uh, element being present. And then there's the electronics, the electronics that goes with that, that converts the signal into pressure. Transducer, by the way, let's look at that word a minute. Trans means across or, well, across, and, and, and deuce means to, in, like, induce, to cause something. And so a transducer changes something, one thing into another. Here it's changing uh, metal deflection uh, into uh, change in the capacitance, which is then changed into an electrical signal. So the transducer is actually changing pressure into capacitance, uh, diaphragm deflection, which is changed into a capacitance change, which then gives an electrical signal, some kind of a signal that tells us the pressure. Now, a capacitance manometer uh, is used uh, to, to measure uh, the ranges that we saw, very, very useful in low vacuum and uh, just into high vacuum. Uh, and uh, usually, uh, these uh, sensors are calibrated for relatively narrow pressure ranges. That is, uh, one might be calibrated to do just the beginning of the low vacuum range, another one might be you know, a little bit different and tailored to deal with the higher uh, or, the more, or the better vacuum part of the rough range and so on and so forth. So they can, they can be calibrated, that is, designed and set up uh, to measure generally narrow pressure ranges. And then when you have a series of them, you know, one, two, uh, together, then you can uh, often monitor the pressure down into, as we saw, down into the beginnings of the, of the high pressure regime, of, of the high vacuum regime. Not high pressure, low pressure, high vacuum regime. So here's a, uh, a schematic on the left and of, of a capacitance manometer, and on the right, an actual instrument. And uh, you can see the wires to the electronics up here. You can see that up here. Inside here, there is a diaphragm, and there, uh, there's a capacitor. And as this diaphragm deflects, it changes the capacitance here, which then is picked up electronically. And the diaphragm deflects because of the different pressures that are here. So on this side, you can be at uh, one pressure, on this side you're at another pressure, the, the lower pressure, uh, 
connected to the vacuum system. So the more you lower the pressure in here, the more this diaphragm will go back to this. This would be atmospheric pressure. So this would deflect less <clears throat> because the pressure out here would be pushing it in. So, and, and the pressure in here would be less. So the diaphragm would de deflect from that to that if you lowered the pressure in here. That'll change the capacitance, which then gets picked up electronically up here. So this is what the tool actually, what, what the instrument actually looks like, what the transducer actually looks like. So uh, indirect uh, reading gauges are a different uh, type of instrument. They don't directly measure the pressure as the capacitance manometer does, but they indirectly measure it by measuring some other property of a gas. And uh, we'll take a look at that. There are three common types of indirect reading gauges, the thermocouple, the Pirani, and the ion. So let's start with the thermocouple gauge. If you remember our table from about five or six slides ago, this is good in the low vacuum range and then into the, just beginning into the high vacuum range, just, just getting started into the high vacuum range. It's a very simple uh, piece of uh, instrumentation. It measures pressure by measuring heat flow. So the more molecules that are around, the easier it is to remove heat from a heated resistor. Uh, the less molecules around, the more difficult it is to remove heat from a heated resistor. That's the idea. So generally speaking, constant current is, is delivered to a heated wire. That's our resistor. Uh, a, thermi, a tiny thermocouple is spot welded to this uh, wire. And as the pressure increases, more gas particles, heat is transferred away from the heated wire. Uh, and uh, the temperature of the wire decreases. Uh, conversely, if you put, uh, if there are less gas molecules, then the temperature of the wire will raise. Uh, a low resistance DC, that means it's just direct current being used to heat, heat the, uh, the wire. If it's a DC uh, uh, instrument, uh, which is the common, uh, then you measure the current with, a, with an ammeter connected to the thermocouple, uh, you can measure the, uh, the current or the voltage, and then you can ca calculate the pressure. So it, it works on the fact that molecules, the more of them that you have, the more easily heat can be removed. The fewer you have, the less easily heat can be removed. Therefore, the removal of heat is a measure of the pressure. And so here's a schematic and you see the gas molecules in the vacuum. So this is our vacuum system up here. Gas molecules strike the heated wire with the thermocouple, and then you measure the, uh, the current, and this can be operated, for example, at a constant current, and you uh, measure uh, what, uh, for example, you could, you could uh, just change the current to make sure you have a constant temperature here, and as the current therefore would be a measure of the, of the pressure, inversely to the pressure, more current, the more you, no, directly proportional to the, to the pressure. More current, the harder it would be to heat this then, because there must be more molecules taking the heat away. So you can calibrate this and figure out how many molecules are here, how easily they're taking the heat away. And you see the molecules are blue here, meaning they're cooler, they get the heat and they leave and take the heat and go away. So that's a, a, a thermocouple type uh, pressure gauge. And physically they look something like this, where here's the heated filament, here's the thermocouple itself, and you're measuring the temperature with the thermocouple, uh, and you have the, uh, the you, you know, here in this case you're measuring voltage, and here you're pushing current through the resistor to keep it heated. Here you're measuring the voltage, which will measure the temperature in this particular configuration. Now, thermocouple gauges uh, have limitations. There's no linear relationship between the wire temperature and the pressure, because think about it, the, the wire temperature, that's heat, the pressure is how easily the heat is removed. 
but it's not necessarily a linear relationship, so you need some calibration. Calibration is where you, you um, determine the relationship, in this case, between the temperature and the pressure. Uh, we said that they uh, uh, get down into the uh, edge of the uh, boundary between uh, low vacuum and high vacuum. That boundary is about 10 to the minus 3 tor, that is a millitor. So they get down to 10 to the minus 3 tor, maybe a little bit below, and they have a slow response time. Parani gauges, it's a, another type of indirect uh, pressure me uh, reading gauge. Uh, its uh, operation is very similar to the thermocouple. Uh, it's just a more complicated version of the thermocouple gauge. And Parani gauges function in one of two ways. Uh, the resistance of the heated wire uh, measures its temperature, so we can uh, monitor the resistance of a wire, uh, and if heat supplied to the wire is constant, uh, w w which would be what I squared R, uh, if we keep the adjusting the current to make sure we, we, that we have the same amount of uh, heat supplied to the wire, uh, then the change in resistance measured by a Wheatstone bridge is used to measure the pressure. So it's the same thing, using a heated wire, using the fact that gas molecules coming to the heated wire carry away energy, and therefore the fact that uh, you need to supply more electrical energy to heat the wire, that would mean you have more uh, molecules present. If you have to supply less electrical energy to heat the wire, then there must be less molecules present. Therefore, the energy needed to heat the wire is related to the pressure. And that's how you establish the vacuum pressure with this type of Parani gauge. Another type uh, uh, is, uh, well, it's the same sort of thing. Again, it's, it's uh, uh, looking at what it takes to keep the, uh, the, uh, the temperature, uh, or excuse me, the resistance uh, the same, or the temperature the same as the heated wire. And then you can change the power. Uh, basically the same thing. You either change the power, you change the current, uh, or you, you keep uh, the current the same and look at the voltage. But in general, you're looking at change in the resistor uh, temperature uh, that's caused by the gas molecules taking the energy away. So it's a little bit uh, fancier design. It uses a Wheatstone bridge so that small changes in, in the resistance, for example, well, Small changes in the resistance are more easily detected, and this is what the, the, the uh, gauge looks like physically. So a Wheatstone bridge is, makes this more sensitive. The Pirani gauges uh, go from the, uh, in, in the, the uh, low vacuum range into the high, uh, well, uh, just into the uh, in, in, into the high vacuum uh, range, uh, and uh, they uh, are, are useful. We saw on that table that uh, they cover a fairly broad range. Ion gauges, uh, again, an indirect type of of uh, instrument uh, to measure pressure. It doesn't directly measure pressure. The only one we saw so far that directly measured pressure pressure was the capacitance manometer. The ion gauge is, uh, again, based on uh, using particles, uh, which of course is what we want to know about, how many particles are present. And what it uh, does is it works by measuring the current from an ionization process, and thereby, by measuring the current, determines how many gas molecules must be around. So the idea is that you have some way of ionizing uh, uh, it's whatever comes in between uh, two electrodes. So it's kind of like, you know, there's a bug, things for killing bugs in the summertime. You have two electrodes here. If some gas molecules from the vacuum come in here, you have a chance of ionizing them, and then the ion is produced, uh, and uh, therefore the electron goes to here, uh, the ion goes over to here, uh, and you have a, a current flowing through here. So by finding out how many bugs come in here, if you will, how many bugs get ionized, the current, you therefore know 
the pressure because you know how many molecules are out here. <clears throat> so it works by measuring the current from the ionization of the gas molecules. These are the gas molecules in the vacuum. Uh, obviously, the stronger the current, the higher the pressure. The stronger the current, there must be more candidates coming in here to get ionized. Uh, it contains a hot filament to help with the ionization process, a positive grid. You can see that the, oh, these ions are positive. I'm sorry, I put a negative sign here. It had a positive grid, which would be, this side would be positive, uh, and a, an ion connector, a collector, this would be negative. So this would be biased. The voltage would be, uh, the power supply would be biased, so that this would be negative, and this would be positive. Ion gauges look, uh, as you see here, so it essentially looks a lot like a vacuum tube. It is sort of a, like a vacuum tube. Um, and uh, you have the grid, uh, and then you have the, the heated filament to, to uh, here to aid with the um, to aid with the ionization process, and then you have the ion collector. Uh, and uh, here's what the gauge looks like attached to a vacuum system. So the vacuum system's over here. This is how the pressure is conveyed. Gas molecules come into here, and thereby, by looking at the ion current here, we can tell what kind of pressure is back here in the vacuum system. So ion gauges are uh, uh, use the hot filament that emits electrons uh, to help uh, with the ionization process. Uh, and uh, these uh, electrons collide with gas molecules, uh, ionizing them. Uh, the ions are positively charged, as we said. The electrons are the negative entity. The ions are the positive entity. And they are attracted to an electron-rich ion collector. Uh, negative, the, the, the ion collector has a negative voltage on it. Uh, ions strike the collector, and by accepting an electron from the collector, they're neutralized. So everything's happy. Every, the ions get their electrons back. But in so doing, the electron has to run around through the circuit, and you measure the current, and therefore you know the ion current. Uh, so the ion neutralization, uh, the act of neutralizing the ion, causes electrons to flow. Remember again, you have two electrodes. This one is um, biased positively, this one's biased negatively. The gas molecules come in, they get ionized. The ions go here, the electrons go here. Uh, the ions are attracted to the negative terminal. There's an external power supply. The electron that goes in here runs around and neutralizes this ion at this electrode. In running around, we get to find out how much current's flowing because we put an ammeter here. Okay, residual gas analyzers. These are not simple vacuum gauges. Uh, these are much more sophisticated, and uh, practitioners call them RGAs, so you'll hear people talk about RGAs. Uh, these detect ions, these work using ions, but they actually detect the mass. Uh, this is how these work. These work you, uh, you, you work by detecting mass, and uh, you can get uh, very good resolution. That is very good uh, mass differentiation. So you can differentiate between species that have very close masses if you get one of the more expensive tools. And what these are actually measuring is charge to mass ratio. And that's what they're actually looking at, the fingerprint. So these things are fantastic for the situation where you have a vacuum, you've got really low pressure in here, but you want to know the nature of the molecules that are still here flying around, the nature of the radicals that are here flying around. And so you hook up a residual gas analyzer to determine that. And so very good for finding contamination, very good for monitoring chemical reactions. Now you can have a chemical reaction going on in here purposefully. You know, something coming in, a reaction, something going on. You can find out what's in this environment when the reaction is taking place. Maybe the reaction is driven by a laser, maybe it's driven by a plasma, Maybe it's driven by heat. These residual gas analyzers are fantastic for 
fingerprinting what's inside here. Very, very powerful tool. The way they work is we have to go back and remember that magnetic fields cause a force on a charge. And the, the uh, equation is F equals Q V cross B, where V is the velocity of the particle and B is a magnetic field and uh, magnetic field density. And this is the force. And this is the vector product. This is the product that you have to use a right hand to uh, figure out where, where the actual product of the multiplication goes. So if the velocity is going this way, <coughs> and uh, if uh, the uh, magnetic field is out of the, out of the paper, the magnetic field is, is perpendicular to the, this plane. So I'm going to try to draw that like that. So here's the velocity of the particles coming here. By the way, they're ions because we need Q charge. Uh, and so if this is the velocity, this is B, then you take your right hand and you rotate V into B, and then your thumb points in the direction of the force if the charge is positive. And the charge is positive. If it's negative, it changes the direction. So V cross B, with our, using the right hand, uh, then the right hand rule, the force is actually this way. So we make some ions down here. We know how to make ions. We know about setting up electrodes, maybe heating up one of the filaments and uh, making ions. So we expect them to be positive. We expect the other ends to be the electrons, which are, of course, negative. So here comes the ions. This is the vacuum system here. And we, need, we see that in this particular vacuum system, there's some nitrogen molecules, which we ionized. There's some water molecules, which we ionized. There's some oxygen molecules, which we ionized. And there's some, uh, well, here's some more nitrogen in this example. So they come up uh, and they feel this magnetic force because the magnetic field is out of the paper here. This is uh, a magnetic fil uh, a man a magnetic setup here, which is being used to filter mass. See, magnetic fields are very good for filtering mass because of this equation. And so the force uh, is... Uh, dependent on uh, the, the actual molecules that are coming up here, but they all have a, a plus charge, let's say. Let's say they're all singly charged. But from Newton's law, we know F equals ma. So this is true. And so we see the acceleration depends on Q over m. That's the charge of the ion. That's the mass of the ion. Just using Newton's law and this equation for force caused by a magnetic field, force on a particle, on a charged particle. And so we can see the acceleration, that is, the, the degree to which it, it, the particle bends. This is acceleration, right? It's being accelerated to the right. The degree to which it bends depends on the ratio of Q over M, or M over Q, however you want to write it. Uh, so it, the... Um, <coughs> The bigger the mass, the less it's going to bend. So you can see that oxygen has a bigger mass than water, for example, and so the oxygen doesn't bend as much. By the way, if the magnetic field is designed very nicely, then there is no force after here, and so it wouldn't be accelerating anymore. This uh, got drawn a little bit badly here. It would be more like that. Uh, and the nitrogen is has a mass that's a little bit less, so it... Uh, is accelerated more, so there's more bending, and this is pretty good. It comes out here straight. The water, of course, has a lot less mass than oxygen O2. It only has one oxygen, and, and hydrogen is very light. So the uh, the uh, mass of the water is uh, is low, and so it accelerates a lot. So you can see a lot of bending here. Then, of course, as we said, if the magnetic field is constant outside of here. The force is constant, so this really should be drawn like this, not like that. So here comes the different uh, uh, atoms, excuse me, the different ions coming out of here. This is charged. We use the charge. This is charged. This is charged. And then we can have a detector, and in this case, 
only the nitrogen gets through, so we know nitrogen is present. We can change the magnetic field so that only the oxygen gets through, so we know oxygen is present. We can change the magnetic field, uh, make it smaller, right? And then only the water molecule would get through. So we have a way of figuring out, this is amazing, we have a way of figuring out what is in the vacuum system using a mass filter based on the Q, V cross B force of a magnetic field on a charged particle. So what you're really measuring in these residual gas analyzers is the Q over M ratio, or uh, I like to think of it, just about everybody calls it the M over Q ratio, the, the inverse of what you see here. So that's how these things work. And here you can see what we call a cracking pattern. In other words, here we're looking at a vacuum system that had methane in it. So methane was inside here, the CH4. Why would uh, methane be in a vacuum system? Well, perhaps you set up a plasma, perhaps you have the methane coming in, perhaps you're decomposing the methane molecule and depositing a carbon film. But you want to know the details of what's going on inside here. What's actually in here uh, during this process? That's what science and technology is all about. You, especially if you're trying to get high yield, you have to know exactly what's going on in the process. So we're trying to find out exactly what's flying around in here. And by using this mass filter, we're able to scan across here. <coughs> you can see what we're doing is changing the magnetic field. And we're scan across here and we can find out, uh, oh, wow, there's hydrogen present. Actually, there's H2 ions present also. There's carbon ions present. There are carbon uh, hydrogen ions, carbon with two hydrogens carbon with three hydrogens, so carbon with three hydrogens would be you know, one hydrogen here, one here, one here, there's a missing hydrogen, uh, so here's, and, and this, you, you can see what this would look like, so on and so forth, so that's positively charged, and here is actually a methane molecule, so the molecule is there, but it's lost an electron, uh, and it's positively charged, so you can see what's flying around by looking at the mass over charge ratio, or in this case, since they're all single positively charged, we're really just looking at the mass. So you can see the mass of these different species. Vacuum valves. Well, now that we know how to figure out what's in a vacuum system, either getting the total pressure or really finding out what's in there using a residual gas analyzer, uh, we need some valves to be able to control what goes in and what comes out. And we, the, these valves are very, very important. For example, we might have a vacuum system with a load lock or an antechamber. And so we would uh, need to have a, a valve here where we could pump this system down, put our sample in. We need to have a valve here that opens up to be pretty large, allows us to put our sample into here. If we were uh, really good at this, we'd keep this at low vacuum all the time. Uh, so we, once we pass into here, we pump this down, make it a vacuum. This is already a vacuum. Put it into here. We're ready to do our processing. Uh, if we do that, then we don't have to worry about any water vapor coming in, any impurities. We keep this a very pristine, very pure environment with this load lock. So then we shut this back up again. Of course, we shut this up earlier. We open up some valve to let some processing gas in. We, of course, have a valve on here to constantly pump to keep the vacuum system going. And uh, we also are pumping out this gas. So lots of valves. And then we can do our processing. Uh, then we can shut off the processing uh, gases, uh, power sources, uh, open this valve, move this in here, close this, keep this a pristine vacuum. Uh, backfill will say nitrogen, so we have a valve here, very pure nitrogen, so our samples here, then open up the valve here, the door here, and take it out into the atmosphere. So lots of needs for valves. And vacuum valves are, are used, as we can see, for adjusting or maintaining gas flow and for isolating systems one for another. Here's isolating and here's adjusting or maintaining flows. So lots of uh, uses of vacuum valves, very, very important. Uh, the uh, adjustment or maintenance of gas, uh, uh, flow rates, controls pressure in a vacuum system, 
It can also control the reaction of gases uh, that are being introduced into a system. Uh, uh, system isolation separates systems at different pressures. We talked about load logs, reaction chamber. We've even talked in previous lectures about cluster tools, which have maybe a robot in the middle, an entry, vacuum. And this is a, vac a vacuum. You put your sample in here, open up a valve into the robot. The robot opens up a valve, carries a sample into a, this processing chamber, kept very pristine, only used for certain processing. When that's done, the robot takes it back out, closes the valves, opens the valves, puts the sample in here. Very pristine environment, only used for some other processing, so on and so forth. Why? To get that control, to get that yield, uh, to get that kind of performance we need from the devices. That's why we go to all these sorts of, uh, uh, we go to this extent to maintain control of the process. We need the yield, we need performance. Here are some different kinds of valves. Here is a butterfly valve. This just opens, uh, it pivots here, and here you see it open, here you see it closed. It's just a valve flap, uh, and it's rotated to control. You can rotate it to different degrees to control the conductance. Conductance is a fancy word meaning how much uh, are you allowing to go through here? What kind of, uh, to what extent do you allow molecules to go back and forth from through this valve, and you can use it to adjust as a, and maintain a specific chamber pressure. Gate valves, a little bit more sophisticated, here's what it looks like. You have a, a gate which moves over, here's, this is the conductance part, this is the communication part. The gate valve moves over, when you want to close it, it drops in here and closes this off, uh, and you can see that uh, you can use it then to uh, to separate load locks, reaction chambers, or all, all sorts of uh, separation possibilities. It's it's the it's uh, it's can be wide, so this allows the, the opportunity for passing things back and forth. That opportunity was not present with the butterfly valve. Now, this type of valve uh, is a um, an angle valve that has a, a bellows. That is, this is a metal structure that can expand in size. And then you can have the, the actual valve plate come down and seat here. You see that's happened here. So the valve is forced, the plate is forced into a valve seat to close the valve. And this is used uh, in many applications, roughing, pumping, four line switching, going between pumps, uh, different kinds of pump situations. Uh, this is a very good positive type of valve. What I mean by positive is it, it really generally seats very well and, and keeps a good pressure difference between the, the two sides. We're trying to keep a very a good pressure difference between here and here. This is a good valve for that. Needle valves, these are very simple valves where you, you have a needle and you have a handle up here. Uh, here's the handle. And you can turn it to different amounts to allow the gas to flow in. Needle valves are used very commonly on gas cylinders when you're connecting a gas cylinder which has some gas in it. Uh, you often have one of these valves up here to allow the gas to flow and then perhaps goes through some a manifold uh, and then finally into your vacuum system. Uh, these are needle valves uh, and uh, uh, they can uh, they can be uh, very, very good and very fine. Uh, they, they can be set up so that it takes many turns of the fine threaded screw here uh, to, to retract the needle, allowing precise regulation of the, of the flow rates. Well, we have uh, completed lecture five, which is part two of our uh, more in-depth overview of vacuum systems. And in lecture five, uh, we have talked about uh, vacuum gauges. We looked at the capacitance manometer, which was a, 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 the only example we gave of a direct pressure, pressure measuring instrument. And then we talked about thermocouples, pyrrhonic gauges, and ion gauges. Uh, these two use the uh, uh, fact that gas molecules carry away heat. Uh, so they use that fact to indirectly measure pressure. So some calibration is required. Uh, and the ion type gauge that uses the 
fact that if you have particles present, you can ionize them and thereby set up an electric current. And the fewer particles you have present, the smaller the ion current. Thereby, you can also infer what the pressure must be. Then we talked about residual gas analyzer, analyzers, very, very powerful tools that don't address the question of what's the pressure. They're not that simple. They address the question of what's making up the pressure. What's flying around in there? What are the species that are flying around? Very, very powerful tools for finding out what is in your vacuum processing chamber. And then finally, we concluded with a discussion of vacuum valves. We needed those to uh, control environments, to allow gases in and out, and indeed even to be able to pass samples in and out of vacuum processing chambers.